Lecture number two, the book of Daniel. We'll begin this lecture at slide 12 in your PowerPoint. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about the context of the book of Daniel in the Hebrew Bible. This will be a somewhat longer lecture and uh, more material than it was in the first lecture and probably than in some of the other lectures in this series. But there is a fair amount of material that is necessary to understand before you can fit Daniel into the big picture. There's quite a bit of scholarly difference about uh, different aspects of the book of Daniel, and we will try to address that, uh, at least uh, in a preliminary way, in this lecture. Slide 13. Daniel was deported to Babylon when Jehoiakim changed his loyalty from Egypt to Babylon. You may remember from the last lecture that Nebuchadnezzar forced Jehoiakim to change his fealty, and at that time, he sent to Babylon uh, several young noblemen from the court of Jerusalem so that they could become educated in the, uh, all of the learning of the Babylonians. And in fact, these young men, after three years of, of education, would then enter the king's service, either in the diplomatic corps or possibly as counselors to the Babylonian king. But in any case, Daniel would have been one of the earliest uh, of the people of Jerusalem to go to Babylon. You also may remember that Jeremiah preached during Jehoiakim's reign. Uh, uh, that being the case, Daniel may have been exposed to the ministry of Jeremiah prior to his uh, trip to Babylon. We know certainly that by the time you read Daniel chapter 9, Daniel seems fully aware of Jeremiah's prediction that the exile would last for 70 years. So it is quite possible that Daniel may have heard Jeremiah preach before he was exiled to Babylon. And after he uh, arrived in Babylon, Daniel may later have been exposed to the ministry of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, of course, came to Babylon somewhat later than Daniel, after the death of Jehoiakim and then the, ex uh, the exile of Jehoiakim uh, to Babylon uh, at the at the point when Nebuchadnezzar then would establish Zedekiah as a puppet king over Jerusalem. Given Ezekiel's prominence in the exilic community in Babylon, it seems likely that Daniel may have been exposed to him as well, although there is no direct references to Ezekiel in the book of Daniel. Slide 14. It's important to understand something about three large collections of Hebrew literature that come down to us from the ancient world. The one that is most familiar to us, of course, is the Hebrew Bible. This is what Christians call the Old Testament. And this is canonical for Protestants, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, as well as Jews. All of them consider this to be Scripture. There is, however, a second collection that was made in the intertestamental period called the Apocrypha. This particular collection is canonical for Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, but it has not been accepted as canonical for either Protestants or Jews. However, it is important with respect to the book of Daniel because there were some sections that later were added to Daniel that appear in the Apocrypha. These are called the additions to Daniel. And so while these additions are not in the canon for Protestants, they are in the canon for Catholics and Orthodox Christians. Then there is a third collection of Jewish literature, which also was made during the intertestamental period, called the Pseudepigrapha. And this collection of material is not canonical for any of the groups we've talked about, either Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, or Jews. However, it is important because it has a style of literature. It is a style of literature or a genre of literature that has very close affinities with the book of Daniel, so much so that university scholars often think that the book of Daniel is a pseudepigraphical work, similar to the other works that were collected in the intertestamental period. So we'll say a little bit more about that uh, as we go along, but at least at this point you should realize that there are these three big blocks of material that come down to us from the Jewish tradition. And the book of Daniel, in one way or another, is linked to all three of them. Slide 15. These are the books of the Hebrew Bible in three sections. The Torah, 
the prophets and the writings, or the Nevi'im and the Ketubim, if you want the Hebrew names for that. You'll notice that Daniel in the Hebrew Bible appears near the end of the third section of the Hebrew Bible. It does not appear in the prophets of the second section. There will be some significance that will be discussed concerning this a a bit later. But at present, at least, you should notice that Daniel falls into the third section. You You should also notice that if you count the books in the Hebrew Bible, you will see that there are 24 scrolls. These are exactly the same as the 39 books of the Old Testament that are in English and European Bibles. However, in the Hebrew Bible, these scrolls are divided somewhat differently than they are in later translations of the Bible. For instance, you'll notice Samuel and Kings. In our English Bibles, those are 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. So those long books have been divided into two. You'll also notice that the 12... Uh, has been divided into what we call the minor prophets. Then at the end of the third section, you'll notice that the scroll of Ezra and Nehemiah has been divided into two books, Ezra and Nehemiah, and the book of Chronicles has been divided into first and second Chronicles. So even though there are 24 books in the Hebrew Bible, they comprise exactly the same material that are in the 39 books in the English Bible. Slide 16. Now, a further word about apocalyptic literature. This is the literature in that third large collection of Jewish traditional material called the Pseudepigrapha. Apocalyptic literature is a style of literature, and some of it has roots in the Old Testament canon. For instance, there are several sections in the book of Isaiah, two major sections in the book of Zechariah, and several chapters in the book of Daniel that are written in this same style. They are written in a style that seems to depict the end of the world. In the Apocrypha, the second of the great Jewish collections, there is also a book that is written in apocalyptic style, and this is 2nd Esdras. But most of the material that is in this style is in that third large section called the Pseudepigrapha. And here you will notice that several of them are called apocalypses, such as the apocalypse of Abraham or the apocalypse of Adam, the apocalypse of Elijah. You'll also uh, see there is one called the apocalypse of Daniel. This is not the same as the book of Daniel in your English Bible. However, it is attributed to Daniel and does appear in the Pseudepigrapha. And there are various other books uh, that are in this uh, type of literature as well. In fact, in this PowerPoint slide, I have not listed all of the apocalyptic literature that appears from Jewish tradition, but these are some of the major works. Slide 17. There are primary characteristics to Jewish apocalyptic literature and then some secondary characteristics, and I want to talk just a little bit about both of them. Primary characteristics is that apocalyptic literature generally offers special disclosures of what is happening in the spiritual world or the invisible world, the world of angels, the world of demons, the world of God, the world of Satan. These special disclosures are usually given by some kind of angelic guide who allows uh, the listener to sort of step behind the curtain and see things that are not visible in ordinary life. And so they offer special information that cannot be uh, uh, accessed in any other way. In apocalyptic literature, there is usually a dualism of powers in which the power of righteousness is arrayed against the power of evil. On the side of righteousness, of course, there is not only God, but there is also the angelic host, the archangels, uh, those kinds of, of, of heavenly armies that are uh, on the side of God. And then on the other side, There is Satan and the demons and the minions of evil. And so these two uh, blocks of power are pitted against each other. And in stepping behind the curtain or behind the scenes of these special disclosures, the reader is able to see what is happening in the spiritual world. This type of information is also going to be apparent in some parts of the book of Daniel. In Jewish apocalyptic, there also is a dualism of ages in which there is a sharp delineation between the present age and the age to come. 
rather than a gradual transition between the present age and the future age, there is a sharp cataclysm that marks the end of the present age and begins the future age. And here, this sharp cataclysm will be the intervention of God in a powerful and obvious way. Uh, Usually there is uh, the idea of a great conflict, a great war between the powers of righteousness and the power of evil. And so this dualism of ages is the sharp end, the cataclysmic end of the present age and the beginning of a new age. Jewish apocalyptic also contains a lot of symbolism, particularly animal symbolism, sometimes plant symbolism, and especially number symbolism. Numbers in uh, apocalyptic literature, numbers like seven or three or ten or 1,000 often carry values, symbolic values, that are much beyond their mathematical values. So this needs to be paid attention to, and we'll find some of that in the book of Daniel. Furthermore, there are often animal symbols uh, that represent not simply uh, four-footed creatures in the forest, but rather represent political entities and the powers of the world. And we will see this in Daniel as well. Sometimes there is symbolism regarding the celestial bodies, like the stars, the sun, the moon, those kinds of things. So in the book of Daniel, you're going to have some connections with this feature of of apocalyptic literature. Also, there are cosmic disturbances that uh, typically are described in apocalyptic literature, in which the uh, stellar system begins to collapse and the sun and the moon are darkened, things like that. So this is fairly typical uh, of apocalyptic literature. In stepping behind the curtain to see the invisible world, one will see angels and demons. One will see archangels. In fact, this is where we first meet archangels, is in the book of Daniel, and then later more extensively in Jewish apocalyptic literature. You will also see Satan and the development of Satan in this literature. Satan is actually not mentioned very often in the Old Testament. You'll only find him in the book of Job and in the book of Zechariah and one brief mention in the Chronicles record. But uh, once you get to Jewish apocalyptic literature, you find extensive work uh, in the development of demonology and Satanology, as well as the development of angels. Finally, there is often in apocalyptic literature a champion or a hero that is on the side of God. This is a messianic figure, and sometimes he goes by the title the Son of Man. That title you will find in the book of Daniel, but you will also find it in the book of First Enoch. And then later, of course, that title is going to be used by Jesus in the New Testament. So the messianic figure in the Jewish apocalyptic literature is a figure who is the champion of God's side and who leads the armies of God to victory over the powers of evil. There are some secondary characteristics as well, and one of them is pseudonymity. Most of the books that are in the Jewish apocalyptic corpus are books that are attached to names of ancient people, people like Enoch or Elijah or Abraham or Adam. These were not works written by these people, but were written under their names as a pseudonym. Now, sometimes university scholars will assume that the book of Daniel is the same, that it was also written under a pseudonym, and we'll say more about that later. But in any case, this is a characteristic of apocalyptic literature that you do find in the collection of the pseudepigrapha. These works often also have a uh, marked pessimism about the present age. In other words, they see the present age as hopelessly given over to evil, that there really are very few redeeming values in the present age, and it will take the uh, intervention of God to end this present age before the powers of righteousness uh, can be uh, exalted. And then finally, apocalyptic works usually contain pseudo-prophecy or what you might call uh, prophecy after the fact. Sometimes they will describe things that are historical, but they will put them in a form as though they were given as prophecies. So in essence, they, even though they aren't truly prophecies of the future, they sound like they were prophecies of the future, even though they were given after the fact. And sometimes university scholars will say this about the book of Daniel as well that the book of Daniel also contains pseudo-prophecy. We will uh, address that in more detail in just a few moments. Slide 18. 
Now a word about biblical languages. The book of Daniel that you find in your English Bible will come to you from two ancient languages, Hebrew and Aramaic. And if you look at the additions to Daniel that are in the Apocrypha, that part of Daniel comes to us in Greek. Hebrew is a West Semitic language which uh, came to a standardized form in about the 14th century BC. And most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, as well as about half of the book of Daniel. Aramaic uses the same alphabet as the, as the Hebrew language, but it is in fact a distinct language. And it is the international language of diplomacy in the ancient Near East. Aramaic would have been used by the Assyrians, the Babylonians, as well as the Hebrews, but they would not have used Hebrew. And there are some parts of the book of Daniel that are written in Aramaic, particularly in the middle part of the book of Daniel. You'll also find there are some parts of the book of Ezra that are in Aramaic, and there are a, a handful of words and phrases in the New Testament that are in Aramaic as well. But we will be focusing upon those parts that are in the book of Daniel. After the conquest of Alexander the Great, in which he took over the Persian Empire, Greek began to be widely used in the ancient world. And most of the New Testament, of course, is written in Greek. However, the so-called additions to Daniel in the Apocrypha are also written in Greek. And so there is a link to Daniel uh, with respect to the Greek language as well. So all three of these languages will figure in our uh, reading of the book of Daniel. More details on that, slide 19. Here are the languages as they appear in the book of Daniel. Daniel begins in Hebrew, and from the first verse through the middle of the fourth verse of the second chapter, that introductory part of the book of Daniel is in the Hebrew language. Once you get to the middle of chapter 2, verse 4, however, suddenly the language changes to Aramaic. Now, you won't notice this in English. Depending upon the version of the Bible that you read, you may find a footnote that will tell you this. Uh, but it is quite apparent in the original language. In the middle part of the book of Daniel, all the way from the middle of chapter 2, verse 4, to the end of chapter 7, will be in the language of Aramaic. Then when you begin chapter 8 of Daniel, it goes back to the language of Hebrew. As far as the apocryphal additions to Daniel, there are four blocks of material that are written in Greek. These are the prayer of Azariah, which is one of the three young men that was sent to Babylon. The song of the three young men, which depicts the song and the praise to God that they sang while they were in the furnace of fire. The story of Susanna, which is a story in which Daniel uh, is helpful in exonerating a young woman who was innocent, but she was accused of adultery. And then the story of Bell and the Dragon, in which Daniel demonstrates the uh, folly of worshiping a snake god in Babylon. Now, if you should read a Roman Catholic version of the Bible, you will find these as an extension of chapter 3. So chapter 3 is much longer in the Roman Catholic Bible than in the Protestant Bible, and it will take uh, the first two of these blocks of material and put them at the end of chapter 3. And then you will also notice that in the Roman Catholic Bible, there will be chapters 13 and chapter 14. These are the editions of Susanna and Bell and the Dragon. Uh, in your Protestant Bible, uh, the book of Daniel ends with chapter 12, but there are these two additional chapters uh, to account for the other two stories in the Roman Catholic Bible. Slide 20. So the question arises, why then is the book of Daniel written in at least two languages and, of course, linked to a third language as well? The blunt truth is, we don't know. There are some possibilities, and we'll discuss three of them. One is the theory that there is a translation issue involved here, that perhaps the book was originally composed in a single language, all of the chapters in probably Hebrew. But in this theory, parts of that initial document were lost, and the lost parts were replaced in a second language that had already been translated. And so that would account for the fact that you have Daniel beginning in Hebrew, a middle section in Aramaic, and then an ending section in Hebrew. Now, I should point out, of course, that this is entirely speculative. We have no textual evidence of this sort of uh, uh, 
uh, problem, uh, but at least it is, uh, it is a conjecture that is reasonable. Uh, we simply don't know whether it is true or not. A second theory is a redaction theory or an editorial theory in which parts of the book may have been compiled from pre-existing sources in a different language. If that were true, then parts of the book of Daniel were originally composed in Hebrew, parts were composed in Aramaic, and those parts were brought together in what we call the book of Daniel today. We certainly know that this sort of thing uh, happened in some other books of the Old Testament. For instance, the books of First and Second Kings were compiled out of pre-existing sources, and frequently in the books of First and Second Kings you will find references to the archives of the kings of Israel and the archives of the kings of Judah. This was the source material for, the, for what later becomes the book of First and Second Kings. Whether this actually happened with the book of Daniel or not, we simply don't know. But at least it is one of the theories that attempts to account for the fact that the book is in two languages. The third theory is a theological theory. And this is the one that is adopted by probably more conservative scholars than anyone else. Here, the idea is that the book intentionally was written in two languages to reflect some theological concerns. The author used Aramaic for those sections that dealt with international issues, and he used Hebrew for those sections that concerned the people of Israel and God's kingdom. And so in this way, there is a theological basis for the two languages in the book of Daniel, and it doesn't have anything to do with either translation or redaction. It has to do with a focus, a theological focus, in these sections of the books. In the end, we will have to simply say none of these theories has captured the day entirely. They are all speculative to some degree. Uh, so we sort of leave these theories on the shelf. Uh, you can think about them, uh, but at present at least there is not some consensus about which of these might be true. Slide 21. These are the texts of the book of Daniel that we use to translate it into English and European languages. The oldest Hebrew texts we have come from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and these are in Hebrew and Aramaic. We also have Aramaic translations of the book of Daniel in what are called the Targums. These are all quite old, the Dead Sea Scrolls dating to about two centuries before the time of Jesus, and the Targums, which are in Aramaic, a bit later than that. There is, however, an older edition of Daniel, but it is in a translated language, and that is in the Septuagint. Here, the book of Daniel has been translated into Greek, and this is even older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, because it is not the original language of Daniel, it probably carries a bit less weight than the text in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the early Christian era, the book of Daniel was translated into several other languages. It was translated into Latin, into Syriac, and then there was a Christian by the name of Theodotion who translated the book of Daniel into Greek. The importance of Theodotion's work is that his, his translation is considered to be a much better translation than the Greek translation in the Septuagint. And so if you happen to read a Septuagint, uh, a printed Septuagint, a modern printed Septuagint, you will discover that it will contain both the old Septuagint translation of Daniel as well as the somewhat later translation of Theodotion. And Theodotion's translation is considered to be uh, more accurate than the Septuagint. If you're looking at the footnotes in, say, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the Septuagint is usually trans, uh, footnoted as the Roman numeral 70, while Theodotion's is simply uh, by the letters GK for the Greek of Theodotion. Then, as late as the 9th century AD, we have the Hebrew texts that come to us from the Jewish Masoretic tradition. Both those traditions which contain uh, pointed text, which is a text with small marks that indicate the alphabetic, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the vowels uh, of the Hebrew words, and then an unpointed text, which is simply consonants without vowels. These are important because they are in the original language and they are complete. They are not fragmented, whereas the Dead Sea Scrolls are fragmented and the other things that we have are translations. The pointed Hebrew and the unpointed Hebrew reflect the actual original language of Daniel and they are complete texts. Slide 22. 
this is just uh, a look at one of the ancient Septuagint copies we have. It's on papyrus. It is in Greek, and it is housed in Cologne in Europe. It's called Papyrus 967 and contains part of the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Much of what we have in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is contained in uh, fragments just like this. Slide 23. Now a word about the structure of Daniel. Daniel rather neatly falls into two sections. Chapters 1 through 6 are all written in the third person, as though someone else were writing about Daniel. These contain the story of the arrival of the young men in Babylon, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the experience of the furnace of fire, the uh, period of Nebuchadnezzar's madness, the fall of Babylon to Persia, and then the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. Chapter 7 through 12, on the other hand, are written in the first person. These are written as though Daniel himself is writing an autobiographical account of four visions that he had while he was in Babylon. It's interesting that the third-person sections and the first-person sections do not match the Hebrew and Aramaic language sections of Daniel. So what you will find is that in chapters 1 through 6, which are all written in the third person, part of that is in Hebrew and part of that is in Aramaic. And when you get to the second section of Daniel, which is written in the first person, the uh, beginning part of that is in Aramaic and the closing part of that is in Hebrew. That being so, this seems to lend some weight to the idea that the book of Daniel was composed in two languages for perhaps theological reasons rather than the other kinds of speculative ideas we discussed earlier. But in any case, this is uh, the basic structure of the book of Daniel in these two major sections and the divisions between them. Slide 24. Now we come to a really a huge issue with respect to the book of Daniel. And that is who wrote this book and when was it written? There are two major opinions on this. One of them largely is the opinion that will come from the universities. And you can go to any of the major universities in Europe, in England, in America, and this will be the basic position that will be taken. This position says that the book of Daniel was written in the 2nd century B.C. It was not written by Daniel in the time of Babylon. It was written much later than that. And therefore, this is why the book of Daniel appears in the third section of the Hebrew Bible, rather than the middle section of the Hebrew Bible. Especially, this theory depends upon the visions in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel 11 and 12, because these are the most historically detailed visions in the book, and they are copiously detailed about the history of the 2nd century. They concern partly in the 3rd century B.C., but mostly in the 2nd century B.C., and they concern the kind of details that most modern historians at the university find uh, could only have been written by someone who had already uh, seen those events happen and knew about them intimately from history. So in this sense, then, the university scholar will say that the book of Daniel is written as prophecy after the fact, and it would include the book of Daniel as a typical pseudepigraphical work. Furthermore, there are a handful of Greek and Persian loan words in the book of Daniel. These just occur on rare occasions. For instance, uh, the musical instruments that are uh, described in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, in which the music plays and everyone is supposed to bow down to the image of Nebuchadnezzar. These are, are Greek words, for instance. And they seem a little out of place if the book of Daniel were written as early as the 6th century B.C. They certainly seem at place in the 2nd century, when most of the world spoke Greek. Furthermore, the university scholar will say that the apocalyptic style of Daniel is more at home in the 2nd century when all of the other pseudepigraphical works were being written. And it would simply include that include Daniel as one of those kinds of works. So in this conclusion, Daniel was written by some unknown Jew using the name Daniel and using prophecy after the fact. In particular, they identify the book of Daniel with a, a, a Jewish struggle against the Syrian Greeks in the middle of the second century BC. Much more will be said about this when we get to Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel's chapter 11 uh, and uh, the end of the book. Uh, 
But for now, just keep in mind that there was a, a huge struggle between the Jews and uh, a portion of Alexander's empire. And uh, university scholars identify the book of Daniel as concerned with that particular historical period. The much more conservative approach to the book of Daniel, and in fact the one that I will take in this series of lectures, argues for a 6th century Daniel. That this book is compiled by the Daniel, who it appears to be compiled by, that the first person sections are written by Daniel in the 6th century B.C., and that there is no pseudonymity in this book. If one accepts the legitimacy of predictive prophecy, that is the idea that God actually is sovereign, knows the future as well as the past, then accurate details about a second century uh, uh, ser series of events to come is not a problem. God sees those things as clearly as he sees the past. And through his prophets, he is able to predict those things in much detail. So if one can accept the miraculous nature of Scripture and the miraculous nature of prophecy itself, then the legitimacy of uh, predictive prophecy is not in, called into question. In fact, the idea that Daniel appears in the third section of the Hebrew Bible is not as impressive as it might sound at first, because there is another book, Zechariah, which contains apocalyptic style as well, and that is in the second section of the Hebrew Bible. Probably... The thing that is most significant for most conservative Christians is that Jesus himself credits the book of Daniel to Daniel the prophet. If Jesus thought it was written by Daniel the prophet, then the only way that it would not have been written by, the, by Daniel the prophet is either Jesus was ignorant of that, which most Christians would find difficult accepting, or uh, Jesus accommodated himself to... Uh, to a historical situation that wasn't, was not, in fact, uh, the truth. Uh, so the fact that Jesus credits the book of Daniel to Daniel the prophet has been uh, very weighty for most conservative scholars. And, in fact, it is very weighty for me myself. In any case, I will be discussing both of these views as we work through the book of Daniel. You may keep in mind that for my own uh, purpose, I uh, am in the camp that says Daniel was written in the 6th century B.C., but I am very familiar with the university uh, approach, and I will be talking about that as well. Slide 25. How one answers this question about authorship and date becomes highly significant for how you understand the meaning of the book of Daniel. There are, in fact, three major approaches to the book of Daniel. And in addition to these three, there are variations of them and some minor approaches as well, which we will probably not have time to even talk about in this series of lectures. But I do want to talk about the three major views. And as we work our way through the chapters of Daniel, we will be referring back to these three views at various times. One of them is called the Maccabean view. This is the historical critical view of university scholars. In this view, the book of Daniel concerns the fall of Jerusalem, all the way back when Nebuchadnezzar burned down the temple, to the oppression of a Syrian Greek ruler by the name of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, which takes us to 167 B.C. In this viewpoint, there is virtually nothing in the book of Daniel that extends beyond 167 B.C. The book of Daniel is largely locked within the period, a couple of centuries, nearly at least, before the time of Jesus. In this particular viewpoint, the visions of the book of Daniel all concern the struggle of the Jews against the Syrian Greeks. And the Jews are under the leadership of a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus, which is why it's called the Maccabean view. Judas Maccabeus is the general of the Jewish army who opposes the Syrian Greeks. And so all of the material in Daniel, all of the visions in Daniel, concern that period of time in this particular interpretation of the book. If you should buy a commentary of the book of Daniel in any of the major commentary series that are written by critical scholars, say the Anchor Bible series, uh, for instance, or um, uh, the Jerome Biblical Commentary series, um, or um, uh, the Peaks uh, Biblical Commentary, these kinds of commentaries that are written by critical scholars, all of them will fall into this particular viewpoint. 
There is a second viewpoint, however, that has come to be very popular among conservative Christians for the past two centuries. This viewpoint is called the dispensational view. It began in England among the Plymouth Brethren back in the 1830s, but by the end of the 19th century it had moved to America, where it has become quite popular among conservative Christians in the United States. Furthermore, since Christians in the United States often send missionaries to various parts of the world, this particular view has been carried by missionaries, and so it is now known uh, in virtually all parts of the world. This particular viewpoint says that the book of Daniel extends from the fall of Jerusalem to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ at the end of the age, that its focus, in fact, is upon the future, not the past, and its focus is upon primarily what will happen when the world ends. This particular viewpoint we will be talking about as well, because uh, regardless of, of where you do ministry work, you will probably encounter this viewpoint, and you will find Christians who uh, embrace this viewpoint. Then there is uh, what is the older view, older than the dispensational view at least, and in fact older than the Maccabean view. This is the oldest view of the book of Daniel, uh, and it is also generally held by conservative Christians. It's called the Messianic view, or the traditional view. And this extends from the fall of Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah. But the focus here is as much on the first coming of Messiah as it is the second coming of Messiah. As Christians, of course, we understand Jesus talking about the fact that he would come again. And so there is both a first and a second coming. And in the Messianic view, the book of Daniel embraces both of these ideas, both the first coming and the second coming of the Messiah. And it does very much affect that you, the, the way that you would interpret certain passages in the book. So as we work our way from chapters 1 through chapters 12 in Daniel, I will be coming back again and again to these three views. The Maccabean view, the dispensational view, and the messianic view. As far as my own preferences are concerned, and I will state those uh, plainly, I will be following uh, the messianic view as probably the one that most uh, nearly uh, captures the spirit of the book of Daniel. If that is true, then the purpose of the book of Daniel certainly does offer insight into God's future plans for his people, as it says on slide 26. The Jews had lost their land, they had lost their temple, they had lost their king of the line of David, and they had lost their capital. And yet the prophet said that there was a purpose that remained for them in the future, and the book of Daniel outlines that purpose. That purpose is especially concerned with the coming of the Messiah. And it moves from the captivity of Judah to eventually the triumph of the kingdom of God over the whole world. It also includes the persecution of God's people, the coming of the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, and the last judgment. So while I will be talking about all three of these views uh, as we go through the book of Daniel, and there are Christians uh, who espouse one or the other of those views, for my own purposes at least, uh, you can uh, put me into the camp of the Messianic interpretation. Uh, and I will try to be fair to all of the interpretations as we go through them. This is the end of Lecture 1.